Uh, Daniel has a degree in computer engineering uh, from the State University in Mexico and a bachelor's in Bible studies from the Rio Grande Bible College in Edinburgh, Texas. Uh, currently, he's working on his master's, so he's a very busy person. Um, he served in, ver in, in various different areas, um, including the dean of students at the Rio Grande Bible College for eight years. And he's also pastored Primera Iglesia Bautista of Santa Rosa, Texas for seven years. And he's been on board with the BGCT uh, for two years as the service representative for Area 3, which is South Texas, uh, which stretches basically anything south of San Antonio all the way over to the coast and the valley and all that good stuff. So, Daniel, you come and uh, share with us what the Lord has on your heart. Well, thank you, Pastor Van, for the opportunity. Um, I'm thankful. Uh, that God has given me the, the opportunity to be here this morning, and uh, I wasn't sure if I should come or not because uh, my wife said, well, I'm, um, we, I'm starting to have contractions, so uh, can you hold it for a minute? I told her <laughs> for just a few hours, <laughs> and she said, don't worry about it, I think, uh, but I have to go back as soon as we finish here. Uh, thank you for this great opportunity, and uh, I want, on behalf of the Texas, uh, of the Baptist General Convention of Texas, and on behalf of our executive uh, director, Dr. Um, David Hardich, uh, I bring you greetings, and I want to thank you for being a partner with a Texas Baptist in expanding the kingdom of Jesus Christ here in the state of Texas. And um, I'm so thankful, like, like I said before, to be here. I've known Pastor uh, been for a couple of years, I guess, from the from when I first started with Texas Baptist or the BGCT, and uh, I'm glad for the opportunity this morning. Like Pastor mentioned, yes, I have an engineering degree uh, from a Mexican university in the state of Tamaulipas, and so that's why you will hear this accent. So you will have to deal with it for a few minutes. Okay, <laughs> thanks for your patience. All right. Um, why don't we stand up and pray? I'm, I, I, I'm in love with the worship. You know, it's beautiful. And, and we were able to think of God and, and to worship him and honor him together, uh, you know, as the body of Christ. I'd like to pray this morning. Thank you, God, for this time, for this opportunity. God, thank you for the opportunity to get together and worship you and be able to contemplate your beauty, your greatness. And Lord, we pray that you will speak uh, through my mouth uh, the message of your word this morning. In the name of Jesus, I, may, I pray, amen. You may be seated. Just checking if I can read the, the time over there, okay? Um, in the year 2000, my parents were uh, celebrating 25 years of marriage. So if you were to visit my home or my parents' home in, um, in their living room, you will see a picture of the family, a picture that was taken during the celebration of, of their anniversary. I'm the oldest of four uh, men, four now men, obviously. And, um, and in that photo, you will see my parents in the middle with two of their sons on each, on, on each of their side. One particular thing that you will notice in that picture is um, that my mother looks very, very skinny. Um, the reason of her looks was not vanity. It's not because he got on a diet or something like that. The reason was because uh, that she was barely coming out of one of the most difficult times of her life of her life, a time of depression. I remember those days as, it was, as if it was yesterday. Can you imagine what it is to see the person that has been the spiritual warrior in your home, the, the person that's always, that is always there to pray for you? What it is to see her in a very difficult situation and um, with no desire to live whatsoever. I heard, her, I heard her say one time, I just want to die. I don't want to go through this anymore, any longer. So it was terrible. Just walking uh, into our house, 
during those days was like entering a place of um, tension, fear, uncertainty. You could almost feel, you, can, you could almost feel it in the air as you would walk into our house. Obviously, uh, we were uh, believers. Uh, my mom had been a believer ever since she was a, a young uh, um, kid. My grandmother, we, we received the gospel through her, so it's been a third generation now, fourth generation now. But back then, when my mom was going through that depression, that time of depression in her life, many friends and brothers and sisters came to see Sister Sarita, or Hermana Sarita, as they call her, to talk to her, to pray for her. But I remember one conversation from a very well-intended believer who suggested that mom was going through that because of either two things, unconfessed sin or lack of faith. So as you can imagine, that conversation really helped her did not help her at all. It was hard. Um, so what was the cause of behind my mother's depression? We could not, we, we couldn't know any, um, exactly what it was. Was it a punishing act of God? Or was it a purifying God, uh, act of God? Only God knows. So let's open our Bibles. I'd like for us to open our Bibles in the 31st chapter of Job. Job 31, and I would like to take, to take you through a quick overview of that chapter, chapter 31. We're going to go like um, uh, a quick, uh, do an overview of that. And by the way, uh, there's a man by the name of James E. Giles. He's the author of, book, of a book called Biblical Basis for Ethics. He says this of chapter 31 uh, in the book of Job. He says this, In this chapter of the book of Job, we have the highest model of morality of all the Old Testament. The rules suggested here are much more advanced than what we see in the Ten Commandments. And we'll see why. Now, let me tell you something. I am assuming that you already have a general uh, knowledge of who Job was. But if not, if you're new here, or um, if it's your time here of the first time that you have had in front of a Bible or something like that, let me tell you something. Um, the Bible tells us that Job was blameless and upright. He is described as someone that feared God and shunned evil. He also had possessions. He was a wealthy man. He had a great family. He had many servants, workers, cattle, almost like a cowboy, right? Lots of possessions. But through a series of calamities and tragedies, he almost lost everything except his life and his wife. The Bible also tells us that his friends came to see him. They wanted to help him and comfort him. But when they tried to, uh, to find out the cause of his tragedies, his friends ended up accusing him of things he had not done. So that's the background of chapter 31. So um, we'll see this chapter, and uh, it's, you'll hear pretty much Job saying this, Hey, I haven't done anything wrong. For as much as I could, I have been a man of great virtue. And so I'd like for us to see in this uh, part uh, Job's virtue. So we're going to go, uh, Job's, we're going to see Job's virtues. We're going to see uh, Job's um, view of God. We're going to see uh, in point number three, Job's variation. And we'll see Job's uh, vindication. So we'll see, uh, I'm using alliteration with using V all the time. We're going to, to remember the message, we'll remember it as the four Vs, right? So the first one is Job's virtues. So what I did is, uh, the, the chapter, the whole chapter 30, 31, uh, I divided it into six section, sections. We're not going to go through every single one of them because it's going to take us a long, uh, a long time. 
We're just going to go and see what is the, the virtue, uh, to my perspective, that is most outstanding in that specific portion of chapter 31st. So, um, from verses 1 to 12, if you want to take a quick look, I would say that the most outstanding virtue of, of Job is integrity. Integrity. Job has been a man of integrity. He is described as a blameless and upright. He is described as someone that feared God and shunned evil, like we said before. But in chapter 20, uh, 31, he gives us an understanding account, an interesting account, with many details of his own life. This is the, the, the section where we read um, this. I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a girl. Many men and men Bible studies, we've probably studied this before. And we can go on through that section and we can see words like heart, foot, hands, eyes. And it is almost as if Job is saying, you know, my whole body is committed to integrity. My, my whole being, my outer uh, being, my hands, my body, but also inwardly, I am an a man of integrity. Do you get that? So, integrity. Number two, verses 13 through 23. Now, you may have another, you know, division. As you read at home, you might find out that I, it's probably not the best division that I made, but I try to take, like I said, the, the, the virtues that I can see and that, are, that were more outstanding to me. Number two, I'd like to show you that... Um, here, the virtue would be compassion and fear of God. Here we can look at this uh, Job's and his dealings with people of other conditions. Namely, his servant men, his servant women, the poor, the widow, the fatherless. Remember that before his servant, uh, I mean, uh, before his calamities and, and disgrace, he was a wealthy man. But still, his dealings with those in other conditions or social conditions, he did not take advantage of his power or resources. And you'll see that. Now, he, again, he is telling us of his virtues because he's defending himself. Remember that he's been a, a, a great man of God. He is described as an upright man, as, uh, as, as a man that feared God. And still, he's going through these series of calamities. And he's kind of wondering, why? Why am I going through this? And I see compassion in his descript description of himself. We see compassion and fear of God. But we're going to talk about this a little later. Number three, trust. Trust, trust in the right person, verses 24 through 28. Uh, he says he did not rejoice. I'm sorry, uh, 24 to 28, uh, so wealthy, as wealthy as he was. His trust was not in his riches. His uh, trust was not in the gold and, and, and in the possessions that he had. He had a clear idea that all that he had came from God. And sometimes we do need a reminder of that, don't we? That what we have comes from God. Yes, you work. Yes, you're prepared. Yes, you, you went to college. You're, but God is the one who has given you and gives you everything that you have. Number, uh, number four, verses 29 to 32, he says this, and I like to um, say that the virtue that I see here is clear conscious. Clear conscious. He was able to sleep at night. He says, he did not rejoice in the misfortune of his enemies, and he never cursed them. Might not be, might be guilty of this sometimes. When something bad happens to someone that you don't get along with, you might feel something, right? Number five, redemption. Now, this might not be a virtue, right? But uh, uh, Job, uh, Job knew deep in his heart that God would somehow deliver him from the circumstances he was going through. He just didn't know when or how. But he still demonstrates having faith in God as his only one redeemer. Don't forget that, in fact, he was the one who said this famous verse of scripture that says, I know my redeemer lives. You remember that. Number six, 
justice. All right, that's another another virtue. Verses uh, 38 through four, uh, and uh, 240. He was respectful, even respectful to the of the land he possessed. He never was unfair to those that worked for him. He seems to have been a man of justice, a great man, someone you would have wanted to have as a boss or supervisor probably, right? But let me tell you something. Out of all these virtues he displays in chapter 31, 31 there is one thing that I would like for us to focus on this morning, and that is in the second section of uh, this passage, which is uh, verses 13 through 23. If you would like to follow with me and read that part of the um, of Scripture, um, Job's virtue that has to do with compassion and fear of God. I'd like to propose uh, this morning that the view of God that Job had influenced directly the way he dealt with and the, the way he dealt with and treated people, specifically, specifically those of other social conditions. His understanding of who God is and who God was helped him have a better relationship and deal better with those that were not necessarily of his same condition. Remember that he was a wealthy man. Okay, so verse uh, 13 through 23 uh, I'd like to start with verse 13, if you want to follow me there. It says, If I have denied justice to any of my servants, whether male or female, when they had a grievance against me, what will I do when God confronts me? What will I answer when called to account? Do not he who made me in the womb make them? Did not the same one form us both within our mothers? If I have denied the desires of the poor or let the eyes of the widow grow weary, if I have kept my bread to myself, not sharing it with the fatherless, but from my youth I reared them as a father would, and from my birth I guided the widow. If I have seen anyone perishing for lack of clothing or the needy without garments, and their hearts did not bless me for warming them with the fleece from my sheep, if I have raised my hand against the fatherless, knowing that I had influence in court, let, then let my arm fall from the shoulder. Let it be broken off at the joint. So we saw his virtues. Now I'd like to see what perspective of God, according to what we just read, Job had. What, had, what was his view of God? Now, Keep in mind there as we go on that he is trying to justify himself. Remember this. He's trying to say uh, he's talking good things about himself because he's defending himself. He's saying uh, what I'm going through is not fair. God, what's going on? I've been a good man. I've done this. I've done that. Why am I going? Why am I suffering? In fact, some say that that is the topic of the whole book of Job. Why the righteous suffer, right? There might be some different opinions about it. So, the first thing, uh, Job understood that God is the judge, right? Uh, his first question is, what will I do when God confronts me? Note, please, um, if you want to make a little note there, he did not say if God confronts, confronts me. He says, when God confronts me. Job had it clear that mistreating his servants, whether men or women, given, advantage of, of, given the advantage of his condition as their superior, would make God to rise, like some verses of the same uh, uh, Bible version say. Uh, God would confront him for denying justice for those under him. We, this morning, we have heard a great opportunity to serve and to bless our community, but not only that, a great opportunity to save life. Are we thinking about taking advantage of that opportunity to bless and to demonstrate who God is? Now, God would confront him for denying justice 
to those under him. Deuteronomy 24, 17 says, Do not deprive the alien or the fatherless of justice. God is interesting, interested in people receiving justice because they were made in, their, in his image. The second question he asked was, What will I answer when, he call, when, when called to account? Job knew that even with all the riches he had before and all his possession, he was still accountable to God, the ultimate judge. Not only Job understood he was a judge, Job understood that God is the defender. God would not, not overlook or fail to notice any harm done or actions against his creatures, namely the poor, the widow, the fatherless. Psalm 68, 5 say, A father to the fatherless, a defender of the widow, is God in his holy dwelling. Proverbs 29, 7 say, says, The righteous care about justice for the poor, but the wicked have no such concern. Now, not only a judge, he understood that God was a, the ultimate judge. He understood he was a defender in his understanding, according to what we just read. But he, he knows that also God is the creator of human life. Every human life is precious to the eyes of the Lord. And we, Pastor Ben said that a few minutes ago. He said, did not he who made me in the womb make them? Now, this is a very philosophical book as well and uh, but still I think we we have a lot to learn from it I find it interesting that Job is uh, Job is in fact saying the the God who made me also made them we're both created by the same hand how could I destroy someone whom God created this is his basic question now by the way you can destroy someone without killing him. Jesus says in Matthew uh, 5, 22, But I tell you that anyone who's angry against or with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. 1 John three fifteen says, Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. We have to keep this in mind, especially when we face or with those brothers and sisters that we, have, that we find difficult to get along with. Right? Sometimes um, we're called to be united and we're called to be uh, as one. Okay, but also Job understood that God is who determines life, who directs life. He asked this question, did not the same one form us within our mothers? That is his question in verse uh, 15, part B. The word form means to be established as with a purpose. Psalm 139, verse 16 says, Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. So, and as, as you continue, as we continue reading this section, uh, uh, Job uh, goes on to justify himself about the way he treated the poor, the widow, the fatherless, and, and he's giving, giving us serious things and concepts to think about. His understanding and high view of who God is gave him the understanding and the knowledge to be able to deal with others, not only of the same condition, from from other conditions or different social conditions um, because he had a, good, a high view of who God is as a judge, as a defender, as a um, uh, who determines life and who creates life. That was his great view. Now, A.W. Tozer says that low views or a low view of God damages the gospel. So I believe we as Christians, uh, we, we're, we have that responsibility to always show, not only to understand who God really is and understand His greatness, although we might not all 
you know, get to understand it all. But keep God in, in, a, in, a high, in high regard. Every Christian also should care about those in vulnerable circumstances. Job would also, I, I guess, he would also make a great social activist because of what he says there. But you know what? Everything would be great in the life of Job and regarding his virtues, regarding his view of God, if it wasn't for one intriguing verse that we find in verse 23. If you want to go with me, he says this. He says, For I dreaded destruction from God, and for fear of his splendor, I could not do such thing. So now, this, this sentence leaves me speechless and brought, and brought so many questions in my head, like what type of fear was that that Job had of God? Was this type of fear the motivation of his benevolence, for instance? Was he such a great guy because he, was, he had the fear of God, but was he afraid of God as well? Was, this type, was his type of fear what God expects us to feel about him, about God himself? That's some of the questions that came to my head when reading this uh, uh, sentence that he says in verse 23. And I, that's where I think uh, the, vari the variation started. And what I mean with variation is the, the problem, the situation that he was uh, having in understanding uh, the way that God dealt with uh, humankind. And obviously, like I explained before, I was trying to do the alteration there, so I used the V, the word variation. I could have used uh, perception or something else. But um, you see, there's, there's one kind of fear that is described in Job chapter 1, verse 1. The, the Hebrew word for this kind of fear is jirah, the word jirah. is a word used when, when we talk about the fear of the Lord, the Let's say this way, the good fear, the fear of the Lord. The fear that comes by knowing that he is a holy God, as we see in Leviticus 11, 44. But what does it mean to fear God then, using this jira word and using that description that uh, Job is given of himself in the first chapter, verse 1. By the way, Deuteronomy 13, 4 says... It is the Lord your God you must follow, and Him you must revere or fear. Keep His commands and obey Him, serve Him, and hold fast to Him. Right, so fearing God, in the words of uh, Dr. Um, Charles Stanley, for example, uh, he says this, to fear God is to reverence Him, to honor Him, to exalt Him, to lift him up, to worship him, to hold him in high regard, to obey him, to hold him in high esteem. Now listen to this. To honor his position as creator and judge of all mankind. Exactly what we just talked about regarding the high view that God, of God that Job had. Now do you fear God? Do we honor him? Do we worship him? Do we hold him in high esteem? That is the fear of God described with the word jira in the first chapter, first verse of Job. When we, but, but, but we go to, when we go to the chapter 31, verse 23, we see other type of fear. We see the word pahad. Pahad is the fear projected or imagined it is the overreactive, irrational fear that stems from worries about what could happen, about the worst-case scenario that we imagine. And that's exactly what Job was feeling when you read verse 23. He says, For I dreaded destruction from God, and for fear of His splendor I could not do such thing. Now, he trusted God, 
he worshiped him, he honored God, but somewhere in his life he also got to the conclusion that, and perspective that God always deals with mankind on the basis of retribution, right? Like when I gave you the circumstances of my, that my mother went through, this believer thought that God would always deal with men on the basis of retribution. You're getting this because you did, you did that. You misbehave, so I, there's punishment here, right? We'll see why. Now, don't forget that the reason he justified himself, I'm talking about Job in chapter 3 first, is because he's defending his case. Job believes that he's going through, what he's going through is not fair. And he's not only saying this to his friends that are accused, but also to God. God is not fair what I'm going through. He's been such a good man of God, so much so that he doesn't think he should be suffering like this. But also, don't forget, his friends, right? His friends were also trying to find a reason behind his trouble. Job's friends were convinced that Job's situation was a result of something hidden in his life. The result of something he had done to someone. Most of his friends were accusing him because to them God only dealt with men on the basis of retribution. You did this, therefore God sent you that. God sent you that calamity. God sent you that tragedy. Dr. Thomas uh, Constable says this, Through the book of Job, this is a major question that God is answering. Every major character in the book assumed that God governed humankind on the basis of retribution. And you know what? We see this tendency so much in our churches. We begin our Christian walk being saved by grace through faith. But as, as we walk in our faith and years go by, we tend to deviate towards this idea of retribution. Now, don't get me wrong. God will bless you. Uh, God will bless your dedication. Yes, He will. God will bless your life. Yes, He will. God will honor you when you honor Him. Yes, He will. Problem is, when we want to take it to the point of a desire to control God. Okay? Have you, have you heard this? Or have you said, probably yourself, this? Or have you thought of this? I'm going to do this so that God will bless me. Pastor, I'm going to go to church more often so that God will. You fill it up, you know. Um, I'm going to stop doing that so that, I, so that I can get this from God or even, you know, get favor from, from, from God. But what about our neighbor? What about uh, when we think about the circumstances surrounding us? And when we become judgmental, we might say, well, he is in, in, he is in this situation because this or that. They're having trouble because they're in sin. We become judgmental. They're poor because they don't work. I do work, so God blesses me. But they don't, they don't work, so God doesn't bless them. That's why they're... And we start, uh, you know, making this... Um, uh, judge, judging people without understanding what's behind. They're in the condition they're in because they deserve to be like that. We become like, you remember those uh, disciples in the Bible when they asked Jesus in, in John 9, uh, verse 2, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Do you remember that? Um, what was Jesus' answer? He said, you remember that? He said, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. What a great lesson Jesus was giving to his disciples. And I wonder, what if that depression is there to display the glory of God? What if that poor family around the corner is there so that you can help them display the glory of God? What if that widow is there for a reason, so that the works of God might be displayed in her? What if those migrants are there so that they, uh, the works of God might be displayed in them? 
What if the orphan, what if the neglected child is there so that the power of God might be displayed in them? What if the single mother needing a hand is there so that the works of God might be displayed in her? We need to think about that because we have a tendency of retribution. Yeah, They're there because they deserve it. They don't listen. They uh, worship other gods. And, and I'll tell you, when I was in... Um, when I hear of the tsunamis, right, uh, happening in Southeast or Asia, we say, uh, my, my first thing is that, well, wow, man, they're suffering because they're, they, worship other, they worship other gods, right? And, and we start thinking in, a, in that uh, retribution kind of mode. Like I said, God will bless you if you honor him. But... God deals with us or God deals with mankind not on the basis of retribution all the time but he does all the time on the basis of grace he sent Jesus let's continue to see the um, uh, Job, Job's vindication and we we'll finish with this uh, Job's idea was that if God remains silent if you say if you read uh, chapter 20, uh, 31st throughout uh, Job's idea was that if God remained silent, this would be a vindication of his innocence. He was trying to get an answer from God. He was going through this situation, and like in my mother's depression, we couldn't find answers. We prayed and prayed and prayed, and we couldn't find what was going on. Doctor said everything seems to be okay. We don't know the source of her depression. Like in some cases, we will never... Understand why uh, some people go through difficult times even though they're good people, like Job. But he had the, uh, the idea, Job had the idea that when he was expressing his case and defending himself, God would remain silent. That would give him uh, the idea that he was right, that he was innocent. But you know what happened? In chapters 38 to 39, through a series of questions, God convinces Job of his ignorance and also shows him how much stronger God is than Job. Job thought, God remains silent, I must be innocent. But you know what? God spoke. God spoke, and Job becomes speechless. Although by speaking, uh, God is demonstrating that Job was not innocent. God decides to deal with him on the basis of his grace, the grace of God. Amen. And aren't you thankful for his grace? That he doesn't give us what we deserve, right? Because he loves us. He even sent Jesus to save us. Job 42, verses 3 uh, to 6 Verse 3 says, Surely I spoke of things. This is Job talking. Surely I spoke of things I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me to know. You said, Listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Verse 5 says, My ears had heard you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. So some, of the, some scholars say that... Uh, the reason of this book is that um, Job needed, needed repentance. Some say that he was, uh, he was a, a proud, he had pride in, in him. We don't know, but what, what we do know is that God dealt with him on the basis of um, grace. Um, in verse 10, chapter 42, after... Job had prayed for his friends. The Lord made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had. So I'd like to finish with this. As far as much as we think of ourselves as good people, we need we needed Jesus. And we still do. We need the Lord. We need Jesus. Based on my understanding of who God is, how do I deal with God? Do I want to control him? Or do I just want to surrender and say, Lord, here I am. Use me as you please. What is the attitude that I have? 
or that you and I have before this creator, before this judge, but before this loving God? How do I deal with my neighbor? We were presented, like I said before, with an opportunity to serve. How do I, how do I react when I, I am given an opportunity to serve in my community, to show the love of Jesus to others, to save a life? I'm glad to, uh, Sister Nava said, 20 lives have been saved. Wow, what a tremendous opportunity. But I'm sure they're always in need of more, of more volunteers. More people need to be involved in this. How do I deal with others in different circumstances, in different social conditions? Do I judge? Saying, well, they just get what they deserve. What am I? Do I react with grace? and say, well, they maybe went through this, they maybe uh, have done this or that, but I'm going to show them a, what, uh, what a great God I have. I'm going to show them Jesus. And the best way to show, them, to show them Jesus is through you. Will you please stand with me and pray 